The idea was if you could build a car that, you know, weighed less than the other cars, let's say 2,000 pounds, then it could outrun everything else on the road. And I'm a competitive person. It'd be nice to have a car that can win. It would get 30 miles a gallon, again, because it doesn't weigh anything. And everyone would want one. And I turned out to be right on two out of three. <laughs> How did I get into cars? I, I like to say that I uh, have a car disease. I can remember back, I don't know, eight years old, 10 years old, taking apart lawnmowers, making motorbikes and go-karts, and my brother and I would sit by the highway and just watch the cars and name them all. Just I had a general interest in cars from the beginning, but I never did much about it uh, until I started making some money. And I wound up getting a either a 78 or a 79 rabbit and going racing at Blackhawk Farms. I ran into someone at the racetrack who started talking about composite cars and that he could build that Volkswagen rabbit and it would weigh only 800 pounds if he built out a composite. And his name was uh, Dick Respis. Because after having raced for not too long a period of time, you realize the value of lightweight. All the accelerations go up, everything's better. Dick said, well, he's gonna do it. And he went back to his West Texas and he started building this thing. And six or eight months later, I went down to take a look at it. He wasn't getting anywhere. So I took it back to the Florida and I had a friend who had a uh, repair shop. And, and he said he would uh, help put something together for me to test it out and see what would happen. We took it out to Moroso and it just outran everything. So it, as a proof of concept, it worked and, and that got me going on the, uh, the next step, which was to actually build something that would be road legal. So we started in 1985. The idea was to have the body itself carry all of the loads. So I think it was the first car that did not use metal for primary structure. The first car, the Series 1, came out at 2,100 pounds. It had the Chrysler 2.2 liter uh, turbo engine out of the Dodge Daytona Shelby Z, the 87, and I used as many parts from that car as I could. I could have gotten a V8 engine like a Corvette engine, but it was only 220 horsepower compared to the 175, and it was much heavier. So you have sacrificed all the handling and performance and probably the power to weight ratio. So you would have gained a little top speed by the extra horsepower, but probably no acceleration. It was the first car that was capable of pulling over 1Gs. And that was a long time ago. That was back in 1987. Uh, in the crash testing, it far exceeded all standards. The zero to 60s came out right around five seconds. The quarter miles were right around 13.9. The car had stopping distances 110, 105 feet from 60. Nobody was anywhere near that at the time. Now the later Series 2 uh, added the 16 valve Shelby and the, the performance on the Shelby cars were uh, zero to 60 got into like 4.2. The quarter miles got, I want to say, high 12s. So it was, it was a big performance leap. And to bring out the first Series 2 Shelby, I held an event at Sebring, which was a $100,000 challenge. Anybody who could run a faster lap and any would get $100,000. But the money was safe. Nobody came close. It was interesting how it was received. I remember, I forget the name of the magazine. We took it out to, to have it reviewed. And 20 people ran out, 19 of them loved it, thought it was the greatest thing they'd seen, and they were the junior people. The senior editor hated it, couldn't stand it, <laughs> thought it was the worst looking car he'd ever seen and that the design shouldn't be allowed on the road. But everybody gave it you know, excellent reviews for performance, for ride quality, for comfort, it had air conditioning, electric windows, uh, fuel economy, it did everything mechanically it was supposed to do. A lot of people were turned off by the uh, looks of the car, Time Magazine called it the one of the 50 worst cars of all time, solely on the looks. Publicity was uh, terrible from a marketing standpoint. It made it very difficult to sell cars. We built a few for uh, racing to show what they could do. The supercar series was maybe the first one we went into. We went up there and uh, we qualified one, two, four, and five. So we got kicked out of that series. We got kicked out of the Nelson Ledges after winning that three times, 24-hour race. I never kicked anybody out of that. Car and driver, one lap of America, but we got kicked out after winning three times. So we're getting a little bit of a reputation for having uh, serious performance cars because they were just beating everybody. There was just no, uh, 
retail demand for them. I remember talking to uh, Carol Shelby when I brought the car over there and drove it around. And, and we're looking at the car, and I go to Carol, I goes, like, what's wrong with this car? He goes, not a goddamn thing, he said. Lee Iacocca and I sat at that goddamn New York Auto Show in 1964 trying to sell those Cobras. We couldn't sell them until after we quit building them. <laughs> the intruder was the V8 powered consular. It was called a hammerhead. And the hammerhead uh, was a consular, but the front was kind of flattened out instead of going all the way down. And it had a regular uh, consular windshield. Then once I had developed the uh, V windshield, the, I called that the Raptor windshield, Whenever that went on, the car became a Raptor. The idea was to have more wrap and less rake, because it was round around the corners, but big V and then around, so, and not much rake. The air on the top would just stay pretty flat, so the wing wouldn't have to do so much work just offsetting the lift from the windshield. I was looking for something we could do commercially. I got the idea that um, we could build a van. Uh, they all weighed about 4,500 pounds. They got about 15 miles a gallon. I'm thinking I can make this thing 2,500 pounds and get 25 miles a gallon. I don't need a big V8 for the same performance. I can do it with a four cylinder and built one. The van had five foot 10 stand up height because I didn't need all that box section in the floor. The body itself was the structure, same as the consulier, and uh, could never sell the concept. Then the electric car thing came along, and it's like, okay, put batteries in this. It's going to be way better than the metal electric vans. And it, Sure enough, it was. As long as I had those vans, I had this idea that um, I could build something the size of a Honda Civic by seating four across instead of two in tandem. So I took the Dodge Ram van we already had, you know, and I cut the van off after nine feet long. It was a Dodge Ram van, van, and it was chopped, so we called it the Ram Chop. I used to figure, for all practical purposes, maybe 70 miles or something like that before you, you needed to plug it in. A U.S. electric car came in, bought the company from me, and then they went out of business. They were never able to uh, commercialize it either. They, they liked it for the same reason I did and just couldn't sell it. I was working on what I called the R2K, the Raptor 2000, and that was going to be the V8 console or the next level of performance and it started from scratch and then um, Rod Trenet came along uh, from Unigraphics who was a company making software he said he had designed a car and asked if I could build it and I said sure I can build it you know if you guys write the check I'll build the car and he said okay good we'd like to go racing with it and whatnot so if you're gonna go racing you might want to change a few things and he goes like what and then that entered into a two-year development process so the MT900 Maybe in 2008, we sent one to the lightning lap. I go back and see the results. It took six or eight seconds off the lap times of the number two car. And we took one to Motor Trend, the first Photon, which was 350 horsepower, I think. It came in at just over 2,000 pounds. And that car set nine performance records. Uh, zero to 60 was 3.1 back before anybody was going anywhere near that fast. In Europe, the MT900 has been banned from FIA international racing there, so we can run in selectively in the national races, they call them. And so we've never been to the 24 Hours of Le Mans or anything like that, but it's run very successfully in these other races. Back in 1987, 1988, you know, my biggest disappointment was with the press was if they had picked it up for what it was originally and said, look, Detroit, here's this guy in his spare time builds this composite car. You might not like the way it looks, but this silly thing, you know, outruns everything on the road and gets 30 miles a gallon. And it's safer than anything you're making. You've been building metal cars for 100 years. This is the way to build cars. And the press could have really put it to the manufacturers to not just give people what they want, but do something that would have made a major difference to fleet mileage, safety, performance, and opened up the field to like, you know, all kinds of who knows what kind of vehicles these guys would have come out with if, they'd, if it had been socially acceptable to do it. And so uh, it never happened. You know, I once said I build cars because the voices in my head tell me to. 